Hey guys, what's up? It's Shelby and welcome to my channel. So, um, I'm going to be switching my channel up a little bit. If you have been here, you know my videos from the past and stuff. Um, but I am finally sitting down and filming again. It's been so, so, so long. Um, but, um, I want to start a series on my channel like Bailey Sarian does. Um, if you don't know who she is, she's amazing. I will leave her linked down below in the description box. But she is freaking stunning but she does a murder mystery and makeup mondays i kind of want to do that but i want to incorporate not only makeup but nail and hair nails and hair as well um i don't know exactly what to call this yet um but it's going to be during like the mid of the week so like a wednesday um if you have any suggestions on what to call it let me know down below um but pretty much what i'm going to be doing is sitting down telling you guys about a true crime story doing either my makeup my nails or my hair yeah, if you guys are interested in that, keep on watching, subscribe to my channel, and let me know some cases you want to hear down below. Um, so let's just get right into it. The story we're going to be talking about today is the Night Stalker. You probably already know about this, but I find this case super interesting. Um, also, my makeup look that I am um, doing is inspired by t.rinluck on Instagram. Um, yeah, my makeup was inspired by her makeup that she did, so... Before I get any, you copied somebody. Alrighty, so let's go ahead and dive into this story. Um, I'm not going to be talking about every single um victim because there is quite a lot. Um, but let's start off in this was April 10th, 1984. A um nine year old girl was found in the basement of a hotel. She was raped and beaten, and then obviously she was killed because her body was found. But they couldn't figure out who who did it. Like, there was no suspects, there was no leads, there wasn't anything, but there was DNA on her, but they could not get a match of it until 2009, actually, which is really, really crazy that it took that long. And then on June 19, 20, June 29th um, of the same year, Jenny, who was 79 years old, was um, found murdered in her um, apartment in Los Angeles. Like I said, nothing was really linked at first because it was such a different MO and everything. Um, but spoiler alert, in the end it was linked um <laughs> all right so jenny like i said she was found murdered in her apartment in la um she was found stabbed while she was um asleep she also was found with a um slash in her um neck that was actually so deep that her head was almost decapitated which is wow so uh, the person was never um found who did this but what the cops could determine was the person came in through the um window of the bedroom and that is where they found a fingerprint on the windowsill but again they couldn't identify it um just yet but they did keep it in you know files and then we're going to move on to march 17th of 1985 22 year old maria was pulling into her garage when um a man a male um was waiting for her in her garage as she got out he ambushed her and pulled a gun out on her where he um shot her in the face but little did he know she actually survived how'd she survive a face shot you may ask I shall tell you she had actually put her hands up in defense and the bullet actually ricocheted off of her keys and fell onto the floor um so she you know lay down play dead whatever um and so he was like all right she's dead so he went into her house through the garage where he um you know tried to ransack it pretty much you know get whatever he could but he did not know that she had a roommate. Oh my god, they were roommates. 34 year old Dale was in the house when she heard the gunshot go off and she hid behind a cabinet um, thing in the kitchen. And she hid there for a while while she heard him walking around and stuff. And she had peeked her head over when, when the um, perpetrator had 
saw her and shot her in the face and instantly killed her. He then, you know, took jewelry, anything of value that he could, you know, pawn. And then within the same hour of this, of these two attacks, he had found a girl named Veronica in this car. And, um, he, it said that he wanted to take this car. He wanted this as his getaway car. So he pulled her out of her vehicle and, um, shot her dead. But instead of taking the car, he ran. He just ran off. So, but I don't really know what it was about. But apparently he just ran off instead of actually taking the car like they had suggested. They don't really know why else he would have pulled her out of the car to kill her if he didn't want the car, but he didn't take the car. Then on March 27th, he had broken into a house that he had already recently broken into, but he didn't really do much in there, apparently. Um, but this was the house of Vincent, who was 64 years old. And next to him was Maisine, I think is how you say it. And that was his wife, who was um 44 years old his wife was 44 her name was Maisine and they were both asleep in their bed when um a perpetrator came in and he apparently had already been who had already robbed this house before um he had came back my neck is so itchy <laughs> but so Vincent and Maisine were asleep when somebody came into their house and Maisine was woken up to a gunshot and Vincent was shot in the face and died instantly. The perpetrator bounds up Maisine and demands that she tell him where like all the valuable stuff was like you no know, watches, money, jewelry, anything that he could you know have and she did and so as he's going around the house and stuff Maisine actually gets untied. She, you know, gets herself loose from these restraints, gets herself out, and remembers that she has a um, shotgun under the bed. So she goes under the bed, grabs the shotgun, and waits for um, this perpetrator to come back. So when he gets back, she goes, you know, she points the gun at him, shoots the gun, and it clicks. The gun is not loaded. And this makes the perpetrator absolutely furious. He shoots her three times, three separate times, then goes into the kitchen for a knife. He gouges her eyes out, puts them in a jewelry box, and takes that with him. Yeah. Gross. So, but... What the police um found at the crime scene when they, you know, came and found them and investigated, they found a footprint in the flower bed that was like outside um their yard so they could actually, you know, keep that. They um casted it and everything so that they could figure out, you know, what kind of shoe print it was and all that. Also found bullets that had matched the previous three attacks. So that was the first time that they linked all of these together and realize that they have a um, serial killer at their in their hands that they had really not a lot of evidence to capture pretty much and then on May 14th um, 64 year old or 66 year old Bill and his wife who was disabled and she was um, 56 her name was Lillian they were in their house um, they were both in separate rooms when when somebody broke in and um, there was a confrontation between um, Bill and the perpetrator that, you know, came in. They had a little confrontation and then the perpetrator had shot Bill. Um, he shot Bill in the face and then he went to the room where Lillian was at and he bound and uh, raped her. And then he loots the house like he usually does and, you know steals valuables and bill later died in the hospital um from the gunshot and then in may 29th 83 year old maybell and 81 year old florence um they were sisters and um they were um living together they um 
got a break in the perpetrator goes into the kitchen first the perpetrator found a hammer in there and he grabbed it and then Florence actually saw him first and was pretty much like confronted by him first um, and that is when the perpetrator um, beat Florence with the hammer and then found um, Mabel. He then bounds Mabel and beats her with the hammer and then he got some electrical wire from somewhere and actually um, electrocuted both of them using this electrical wire and rapes Florence and um, finds lipstick on a counter where he draws a pentagram on Mabel's thigh and a room in one of the um, bedrooms. They were both found two days later and they were actually still alive and they were taken to the hospital right away. July 2nd, um, 1985 still, um, 75 year old Mary was, um, in her house when somebody snuck in and, um, while she was asleep and they beat her with a um, lamp until she was unconscious and then they again looted the house, got valuables, all that good stuff, um, and left. But sadly, um, Mary was later found in her house and she um, had passed away. On July 20th, somebody breaks into a couple's house um, at like 4 a.m. in the morning and goes into the bedroom where a um, husband and wife are asleep and he shoots the um, husband which killed him instantly and then he bound the wife and raped her. They had an eight-year-old son who was also in the house and he had walked in because he heard the uh, the commotion happening and um, the perpetrator had bound the eight-year-old and drug him around the house, you know, telling him to show him where all the valuable stuff was and also said, and I quote, while he was doing, you know, this, told the kid, and I quote, to say that he swears to Satan that he's not hiding any valuables, which is... Wow. Anyways, um, um, took all the stuff that he could find and then left the kid bound, um, in the house and left, um, but the kid had actually gotten up and ran to a neighbor's for help and they called the police and everything and took down statements and all of that. So, I mean, there was, there is more victims, there's about 25 different victims in this story, but the police were starting, you know, to connect everything i mean it wasn't that hard every everything has almost the same mo the same story the same everything um it's mostly couples and older people that are being you know targeted it's pretty much older couples and couples in general so this was the first time that they made a public statement to you know on tv and everything um pretty much just warning the public, scaring the public that, you know, there was somebody out there who was breaking into houses and stealing and raping and looting and murdering all these people and putting all this fear into the public. And this was the first time that they gave this person a name and that name was the Night Stalker. The detectives on this case were absolutely furious because they knew that the Night Stalker was watching and knew that, you know, he was either going to stop or he was going to leave and they wouldn't be able to find him, you know, because now he knows they're onto him. Now we skip to August 27th, a little bit on the outskirts of LA. Um, there was a boy who was about 14? He was 13 years old. His name was James. He was um, outside of his house, or he was inside the house when he heard footsteps coming from outside. And this completely freaked him out because everybody heard about the Night Stalker and everybody was terrified that it was, that they were going to be next. So he went and alerted his parents um, upstairs in their bedroom and they started making so much noise to, you know, try to scare this attacker away so that, you know, they they wouldn't be the next victims of the Night Stalker, um, and it actually worked because the person who, um, 
was there um actually left but before he left the 13 year old boy james he actually ran outside with a notepad he was very very brave he ran outside with a notepad and wrote down the lace wrote down the car that the person was driving um um got as much detail in the car as he could and got a couple um license plate numbers and letters off of the person's license plate and this car was um later found um ditched somewhere and they scanned it for fingerprints and everything and luckily they found a fingerprint on the rear view mirror they took that fingerprint all the way back to their station and ran it and they finally had a name to the night stalker and his name was richard ramirez on august 28th the fingerprint was found and then on august 30th they held another public press conference um pretty much saying that they knew who the night stalker was now they talked to him directly through the um through tv telling him we know where you are we have your mugshot you know i mean they they plastered his face everywhere that they could um pretty much just warning him like you have nowhere to go like everybody in town knows who you are now we know who you are we have your fingerprints your name we have everything um an attempt to scare him so now let's talk about richard ramirez that a lot of you probably already know about this story but let's let's take a little deeper into richard so Richard Ramirez was one out of five children living in Mexico. Their father was a um, a worker. He worked very hard in Mexico, um, but he had gotten a job off offer in the States to work on the railroads. So um, his whole family packed up and they moved to Texas where his dad would start his railroad job. But his dad was pretty violent. He would um, beat his wife as long as well as the kids very, very often. He was a very angry um, man. He really didn't care that much. Um, but he was a hard worker. But like I said, he was very, very violent to the kids and everything. So Richard wouldn't stay there very often. He um, would go to his cousin Miguel's house. Um, Miguel was actually quite a bit older than um, than Richard. Um, he actually was in the Vietnam War, which is crazy. I can't. Ooh. Ah. Um, the, so he was in the Vietnam War, which actually messed him up very bad. His cousin Miguel. Um, it messed Miguel up pretty bad. He was in a pretty rough state of mind because for veterans and stuff, they don't really, they don't care that much to help veterans and stuff, get the mental health that they need after going through something like that. Um, so Miguel would actually tell young Richard Ramirez, who was about 10, about about stories about Vietnam and the war and how he used to violently rape women in Vietnam and he actually showed Richard a picture of a decapitated head of a female who he had just raped and murdered yeah so it wasn't it wasn't um great for Richard growing up it was just everywhere he went he kind of just had bad situations um and he also witnessed um his cousin miguel um shoot his wife um miguel's wife he had a wife um and they got into a heated argument one day and um he actually pulled a gun out and shot and killed his wife while while uh, Richard was just sitting on the couch watching. He did end up going to jail for this, but ended up only getting four years in a mental hospital because they found him um, not guilty due to insanity, which is mind-blowing. Um, we're not even, I don't even want to get to that. And Richard was two years old. A piece of furniture had struck him in the head and um i mean it caused a big old gash in his head and also when he was five years old at school he went um he was playing outside on the playground 
when a swing came up and hit him in the head so hard he knocked out and Richard said after this he was having seizures very quite frequently after that um, and if you don't follow a lot of true crime um, head injuries are usually a big factor in almost like every serial killer's past life having a head injury which is I think is fascinating to be honest like that you can mess up part of your brain and become a serial killer I don't know um after a while um Richard decided to move in with his um sister and her husband because he really did not want to go home he had a horrible life at home obviously with his father being abusive and everything um so he stayed with his sister for a while um but her husband was kind of what you would call a peeping tom he would take he would actually take richard at night to look into females windows um you know females that he found attractive or you know they would just look through their windows while they got dressed or um were sleeping or were going to the bathroom or you know anything like that um so anywhere richard went it was just it was just shitty pretty much he really didn't have a good place to go he was just like one thing after another for him so during his teens after this um during his teens he started to show some of his sexual tendencies and fantasies that he liked which was actually violence he um enjoyed uh, violence quite often it you know got him aroused and stuff he started displaying it more often um he had a he was going to school as well as working at a hotel called holiday inn i'm pretty sure most people know what Hol holiday inn is um and he on he actually used this job to his advantage which is disgusting um but he would um take his key cards when the guests and stuff were not in their rooms and he would go um like steal from them take whatever they could from them um and you know all that and then one day um he went up to somebody's room um that was a couple and um, her husband had actually um, been away getting something or whatever, so it was just her in the house, and he, Richard, um, had went into her room and um, bound her and tried um, to rape her, but her husband had actually, thankfully, um, came back to the room while this was happening, you know, got him off of her, you know, they tussled for a while, and finally um, the cops were called and brought in, but the um, charges were dropped because the couple didn't want to um, stand trial against him because they had lived in a whole other state and they didn't want to go all the way back to testify against him, so they were like, just, it's, it's whatever, just forget about it. Um, and then he was fired um, for obvious reasons and this is also when he dropped out of high school in the ninth grade um from the ninth grade till he was about 22 um they there's not very much of what happened during those times but when he was 22 he decided to move to san francisco um permanently and that's when he was staying at a hotel and as you guessed it like i said in the beginning of this video a little girl was found in the basement of a hotel in san francisco and in 2009, it was proven to be Richard Ramirez. And now let's jump all the way back to August 31st. Or August 30th. August 30th, my bad. So we're going to jump to August 30th. Richard had um, committed all these murders, like I said. And he was watching the news when he saw that he'd been caught. They knew he was who he was, where he was, and all of that. He had got on a bus to go to... T Tuscan, Tuscan, I don't know how to say it, Arizona, where his, uh, one of his brothers actually lived, but when he got down there, he immediately left, he didn't go see his brother, maybe out of fear that his brother would get involved, and, um, his brother would get in trouble or something, I, I don't really know, but he got on the bus and then got back, pretty much, on August 31st, he got off the bus back in LA, where he, um, walked into the bus station and that is where he saw all uh, he saw a newspaper rack where you know all the newspapers were you know all the big time newspapers and stuff were there for sale 
And he walked over there and saw his face on every single one of the newspapers. He was headlined on every single newspaper and this completely freaked Richard out. So he ran out of the bus station and ran into the freeway where he um, stopped a woman driving and he tried to hijack her car. But I mean, everybody, there were so many people around him that um, they all stopped him and got him, you know, off of her. And he continued to run, jumped a couple fences and also tried to hijack two other different cars, um, but was unsuccessful. So then he gets to East LA, which is not the best part of us of LA. Um, where he tries to stop a vehicle and tries to hijack him, hijack the car, but there was a group of men um, kind of on the other side of the street watching this happen and they um, came over and realized who it was and um, beat Richard up pretty badly. Um, one of the people had a um, metal bar that they hit Richard over the head with that knocked him out and they held him down. Um, until the cops got there, they called the cops and the cops came and picked him up and that's when they brought him to jail or prison um, to await his first trial. Now, um, Richard had actually stolen quite a few cars. Like I said, James had reported actually a stolen car that um, the cops found, if you remember that. He had actually stolen multiple, multiple cars um, to, you know, do this, but he would... Um, get them, use them for so long, and then wipe the car clean and then dump them somewhere else. But he obviously didn't clean that car very well because his fingerprints were found. At his first hearing, um, he actually carved a pentagram into his hand, was showing it to all the cameras and everybody there and stuff, and was um, just screaming, Hail Satan, um, at just everything and everybody. On August 3rd, 1988, a newspaper had came out that a guard at the um, prison that Richard was at said that they overheard Richard saying how he was going to smuggle a gun into the courtroom to shoot the prosecutor and he was bragging about how he was going to do this and explaining it to all the other jail, like the people who were in the prison with him and he was he was just like gloating about how he was going to kill this prosecutor so um the courthouse installed a metal detector you know in the doorway um so that that wouldn't happen um and then on august 14th the his trial was actually stopped abruptly because one of the jurors that was supposed to be there didn't show up that day so they had to cancel it to find a new juror um and just a little bit later that juror was actually found shot in her um apartment and this freaked everybody out like literally they freaked everybody out that somehow he had connections in jail and got this juror killed but it was actually said that her boyfriend shot her but it still definitely scared everybody this whole story was getting so much media coverage and you know televising and um you know newspapers and all this kind of stuff this was really really big in california right now and so Richard had actually had quite a few fangirls, which is disgusting to think about, that you could fantasize over a serial killer. But they did. He had quite a few fangirls who would send him letters in prison and, you know, send him pictures of them and try to, you know, get with him, which is nasty, but, you know. You do you, I guess. Um, and like I said, the one juror was um, shot in her apartment, so there was a new juror who was appointed. Her name was Cindy, and she was infatuated with Richard Ramirez. Um, and Richard noticed that, that, you know, she, she was always like, you know, kind of looking at him and stuff like that. So he used that to his advantage to try to get her to get him a lower sentence, pretty much, and try to get her to, you know, get him out of this situation pretty much she would write him letters all the time and little notes into jail and stuff like that um and they were you know it would make kissy faces or whatever at each other and all that girl stuff um but when his trial uh actually began on september 30th 1989 he was found guilty of all charges richard was convicted of 13 murders 
five attempted murders, 11 sexual assaults, and 14 burglaries. <sighs> Richard was so pissed at Cindy because he thought she could do something and he completely despised her after this because she, in his eyes, she didn't get him out of it pretty much. Um, he actually got married in prison at some point too and, um, but they ended up breaking up because, um, she found out that he killed the nine-year-old child in 2000, you know, in 2009 she found out that he killed a child and apparently that was too much for her but, you know, all the other 25 counts weren't, um, um, but, um, Cindy had actually gone on to say in, um, public, um, you know, newspaper outlets and stuff like that, that she felt bad for him, that it, you know, that he was represented poorly by everybody and that he did not deserve, you know, what he was going through and just, that just blows my fucking mind that you can think that, um, on November 7th, 1989, um, there's a trial to see, you know, what was gonna happen and they, um, decided that they wanted to gas him in the California gas chamber, but they don't really, they don't do that anymore. Um, so he was just on death row for about 23 years. At about the age of 56, he had passed away because his health took a, his health took a complete downfall and his body was just dying from the inside pretty much and his health just took a downfall and he passed away after being 23 years on death row which to be honest yeah he should have still rotted in hell for another 20 years in my opinion um but yeah let me know what you guys think about this case um i find it very interesting let me know some cases you guys want to hear down below as well um i would love to do more cases of serial killers and kidnappings and all that jazz um if you have anybody in mind just let me know in the comments um thank you guys for sticking around and listening to this um i know it's kind of because it's my first one but i promise i'll get better at it um but thank you guys so much for watching and i will see you guys in my next video bye